talk about how does one approach an elder. And I think that this is really funny because when I met Shirley yesterday, I kind of just walked up to her and said, hi, I think you're Shirley. I'm supposed to be your helper. Nice to meet you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, I think it's really appropriate that she's talking about how does one approach an elder because I think that's a really important thing for all of us to know because elders have an incredible wealth of knowledge. And I know that Shirley definitely has them, like, tons and tons of wonderful things for us to share with us. So, <laughs> Hi, good morning. Thank you for good morning. Coming. I didn't know I was going to be a full house here. <laughs> anyway, welcome. I'm, uh, <clears throat> I, uh, Began last year, a couple of years, and a lot of people asking, you know, asking me, um, you know, how do I approach an elder? What should I do? Or how do I ask? And what's the protocol for approaching elders? And so I, at this time, what I was asked to speak on uh, the topic for the elders conference, I thought it would be a wonderful way to introduce at least. Um, you know, approaching elders. And so uh, what I talked about uh, last night is uh, don't be shy to, um, and don't be afraid to approach an you know, older or traditional person or somebody who's uh, older than you. It doesn't necessarily have to be, uh, if she's an elder and she's an elder, how do you know? Uh, but the community really um, knows the, the, uh, the people who have those skills and knowledge. <clears throat> Those that have, have uh, hard of hearing, I'd like you to move a little further so I don't speak uh, that loud. And I think that comes from the residential school where I will stop to shut up and don't say nothing. So I've always been afraid to uh, to speak loud. And um, <clears throat> I try to, but. Uh, Anyway, I shall begin. When I was uh, looking for information and also from looking at and reflecting my own experiences over the years, uh, being training on a job to be an elder, <laughs> I'll call it, uh, there are many teachings uh, that I learned along. There are many teachings, there are many um, how does one approach an elder when they vary from many tribes across Canada? Is it, there isn't just one uh, protocol for different nations. So there are many nations across here in Canada um, that are familiar how the protocol of how one approaches an elder. I'm familiar with the Anishinaabeg, so I'm, this is what I'm going to concentrate on. That doesn't mean, because I'm telling you that, if you went to uh, BC and you want to approach me, I don't want you to say, well, surely Williams, the elder from Ojibwe, said, and that's right, you're doing it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so um, be careful, just uh, you know, look around wherever you are, how the protocols of how you approach an elder in, the, in different tribes. First of all, this does not give you the qualifications either for what to become an elder. Sometimes when we go to workshops, people think that they, are, they took training for it. It's, uh, becoming an elder is kind of a long life learning <clears throat> uh, in preparing one to be recognized or supposedly, supposedly to um, um, to accept uh, tobacco because uh, when I was growing up, uh, my parents always said um, when I wanted to veer off and want to be a little girl and play, uh, they, all, they always uh, made me pay attention. And the way they made me pay attention is how will you know when you're given a tobacco in the future? How will you know the answer? How will you know? So pay attention right now. Because someday, someday, you may have to know the answer. So that got me back to concentrating what I was being taught by my parents. This will only help one in preparing someone in terms of what to say or do if one wants to approach an elder. 
It will also help one what to expect. It will also help one what to do and not be so shy or be afraid. It will also help one not to be so scared and nervous um, in asking what you want to ask for. And sometimes not just to ask for something, but you may just want to visit an elder, and that will give you the preparations. <clears throat> Many times I have been asked, who is an elder? How does one become an elder? Why do we have elders? There are some of these questions that I have been asked myself, so I always come to, to answer you know, these difficult questions. <clears throat> so uh, when I was asked, I began to learn and find out and pay attention to what do other elders do? And how do they become one? I've learned over the years by other elders before me. One of them, the, uh, Michael Thrasher, named some of those elders last night. And I had the same, uh, some of them, and I had the same teachers. So when I was looking around, uh, I found this definition of an elder. <clears throat> an elder is a person who is still growing, still learner, still with potential, and whose life continues to have within its promise for and connections to the future. An elder is still in pursuit of happiness, joy, and pleasure, and her or his birthright to these remains intact. Moreover, an elder is a person who deserves respect and honor, and um, whose work it is to synthesize wisdom from long life experiences and format, formulate this into a legacy for the future generations. So always looking at the children, how we look at the elders, what we learn from them, and the experiences that they have, and also how they live their life. <clears throat> definition of an elder from the Native perspective is, in our language, the definition of an elder is one, get your feet zip in Odawa, and get a zip in Ojibwe. It means the same thing. Get a zip is an older person. It doesn't mean um, something else, but they both mean the same. It's just the different ways of, of saying Odawa and uh, Ojibwe. And all it means is one who is older than you, one who is wise, who carries the wisdom of some of the culture and traditions, one who has seen and experienced life for a long time, and one who has lived, lived life and can tell what he or she has seen and witnessed the events. That's what the, the definition from the um, from many elders that I spoke to or older than I am. Um, we talked about, we always say it in the language, we talk about the different stories. And there are many other things that they have told me is uh, elders are people who carry stories, who have carried knowledge, uh, who um, are humorous, and we go on and on and on. <clears throat> elders are teachers, storytellers, workers with many different professions. They are professors and historians with a PhD degrees as we know them. They have earned their right to be called that. We don't call them PhD, like Shirley Williams, a PhD, not um, more. But we do the same philosophy what a PhD degree has in the Western world. Uh, they, they carry those things in the same way. And how we differentiate also is how um, an elder is, uh, is given a feather usually in front of the people so that the people witness um, that he or she is being acknowledged. There is not a graduation service, but the community knows when one is ready to be called that and usually given an eagle feather. So there is an eagle feather ceremony in front of the public, usually, sometimes, and sometimes not. Um, it's done sometimes privately. So they vary. And usually they're around the age of 50 or 60s, um, sometimes earlier. 
<coughs> and uh, the ones that are younger, we call those traditional um, <coughs> traditional people that carry that same knowledge or are in training. <coughs> I usually tease out one of my um, girls that I work with, you know, so often that she's being asked and I, I will say, well, she will say, no, well, she's, she's older than I am. And I will say, oh, but you are an elder in training. <laughs> <laughs> so elders are usually respected people. Many elders work hard then to earn that right in the community, whatever community they live in. People witness how one behaves, how one lives a upright way, how kind they are, and gentle person. These elders have gifts that they carry with them. This one becomes aware of things and want to make a change in life, and they go to an elder in the community that they are familiar with or know and trust. <clears throat> Sometimes elders have gone through a rough way and becoming to an awareness of how they changed their life or their changed life, which is called the, um, when you listen to the Etna, the Manitowabe, she talks about life stages, the seven life stages. So sometimes we learn through many hardships in order to change your life so that you can live an upright, upright life. <coughs> Seeking a journey. I got a horsey. I got a horsey throat. <clears throat> Many people call this the healing journey. And sometimes you will hear people that have gone through a really rough life and that they, when they suddenly wake up, um, they uh, become aware that uh, they want to change, they don't want to live that life anymore, so they want to make a change in life, so they call that the healing journey. Uh, I once heard um, um, uh, a lady, and she's, she was talking about her drinking life, and she says, you know, I sobered up, and when I sobered up, she said, I didn't realize I had eight children. Mm -hmm. Now, she just said that as a, she did have eight children, but she just said that in a kind of humorous way, becoming aware that she suddenly had eight children. She knew she had eight children, but pe there's a difference in becoming aware that she had eight gifts of the, the children. <clears throat> of course, it is natural that one may seek help when one needs it. Sometimes when one wants to make a change, like from living a past life, they go to an elder. And sometimes when you ask the elder, you know, how do you change that life, or what can I do? They don't really tell you, but they'll tell you a story. And that's up to you to make that change in life. It is natural to seek guidance and to seek an elder. Traditional person or a medicine person, sometimes that they, they go to. It could be me as a parent, or it could be you as a parent or grandparents. People need something to go by to make sure that they are taking good steps in life. Because everybody in this nation is given the goodness for life and everybody strives for that goodness of life. I want to be good because it's just natural for us. That, um, we think about our life. Um, <clears throat> You know how good you are and you want to be seen as a good person everybody wants to be good that goodness in life and so uh, everybody strives for that and i think if we have lived sometimes uh, not such a good life you know we think about ourselves as a bad person well really there is no really bad person maybe you had uh, uh, circumstances that are not so good and sometimes people say that it was meant for you to live that life for you to understand your experiences and what your mission in life is here. So uh, elders, there are many kinds of elders and they all have special gifts that they carry. Not one only carries all of these. Sometimes they're 
there are things that uh, one needs to know. But also, there is a caution on some elders. One needs to check the reference of the individual in the same way as one checks with a doctor you want to see. Inquire around what he or she is like. What does he teach? Is he a, does he have a good reference? And then people will know. People will tell you. Sometimes they don't tell you exactly, but that's up to you to understand what they're talking about. Can he or she be trusted? Is he or she living an upright way or not following the good ways of life? So it's really up to you to, to see. Elders, there are elders who are healers. Some elders have special kind of healing for wellness. Most elders will indicate they are only the tools but it is the creator that does the healing and that they are really do not have a special power to do anything, but they are tools of life. Michael Thrasher Owl says, I'm not the one that's healing, healing you, but it is the spirit. I'm only helping the spirit to, I'm only using the hands, I'm only the tools of the hands, hands of the creator. The spirits work through their hands or through them each of the elders will have a special spirit helper that will work for them. Their work is to help the people in order to, to, to heal whatever kind of healing that they need. An example would be a few years ago, I attended a workshop. And um, when I started uh, to come to school, uh, we were taking an identity course. And uh, we had a uh, three day, uh, very intense workshop. And the first thing the elder asked was, what is it that you always wanted to be? This is the, I don't want you to say it right now, but I want you to think about it. I'll give you two minutes to think about it. So I thought about mine, and I thought, hey, what is it that I always wanted to be? Now I was when I was 16. I was in residential school. So I thought about, I always wanted to be a nurse. But I also wanted to be a figure skater because my name is Shirley, Shirley Williams. <clears throat> As of then, I, um, <clears throat> I was named after Shirley Temple. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I thought to myself, I always wanted to be a nurse. So then the elder says, okay, then tell me, he says, what is it that you always wanted to be? So I had to sit on this side while mine was. I always wanted to be a nurse, and we went out. We didn't have to explain everything. So I always wanted to be a nurse. So the elder, I don't know how he did this, but he remembered everyone, what occupation or what they wanted to be. And on the fourth day, he came back again after the many discussions and teachings, and he came back again. And he pointed to me, because I was older than somebody, young people that were going to university, like this one here. <laughs> I mean, I was much older. I was 39 when I came back to school. So anyway, um, <clears throat> he says, what is it that you always want to be? So he says, you, grandmother. He said, you are a nurse. Well, if you wanted to be a nurse, you have to get a certificate, you have to take training, and all blah, blah, blah. And then he, then he turned around and said, uh, synthesize everything, how he looked at me, what he saw in me. And he says, you are a nurse. And I thought, oh, in my mind, I thought I was supposed to take training. I didn't have any training. And then he says, you know your language and culture. And I thought, Yes, I know a little bit of that. And then he says, you have the opportunity, if you know your language and culture, you have the opportunity to nurture the minds of your people. And then I thought, ooh, is that my calling? So every opportunity after that, when I graduated, all, even when I was still in school, it was, I was like tutored students who were learning from Frank Wade Billy 
the language and so on. <clears throat> Everything felt was teaching the language. And I did finally become a professor of, of language. I took linguistic courses. And when I was uh, taking the courses of the linguistic courses, and uh, the linguist he was trying to speak in the language. And I thought, yeah, I know that. He's not saying it right. Well, not quite. <laughs> and uh, I know that. I should be up there. And then I thought, well, I'm going to get through this education so that I could be like him. So that's how I came to uh, know the language. <coughs> the purpose of a healer. <clears throat> Most healers will have thankfulness for their healing gifts that they carry. The gift is discovered much later on in life, and sometimes sooner. One of the most important things is to help the people that need, that do need help. <clears throat> they do not call themselves or write about what they can do. Oftentimes, they just say that um, they are only healers for the spirit. They're working for the spirit. Sometimes, most of them, they practice humbleness. And also, I learned that in Mala, that you don't learn about humbleness. You don't actually become aware of that humbleness or understand the humbleness until you're 40. So those of you that are 40, <laughs> you start the chat. <laughs> so, Learning about humbleness. I'm still learning about humbleness. But a lot of people yeah. see that in me, but sometimes indirectly you don't see it. The spirit is always, um, well, just to go back again about humbleness. I work in the university. One of the things that I always had a big problem with was um, every year you have to do your CV, you have to tell what you've done. And so it, I always felt like as if I was bragging. And I thought, oh, that's the worst thing that I could do is to write, to write about myself what I have done. You know? So that's totally different criteria from the Western and also with, with Mishnabek. Because Mishnabek, well, they know you, they can tell you. And it's so easy for me to listen, oh, is that what I did? Oh, that's nice, you know. But for me to, to talk about and do that, that was, uh, that was difficult for me. <clears throat> for Nishnavik, then, um, the elders, if they have that special gift. The spirit is always given the credit. When they do ceremonies, it is a spirit helper that is called upon to come. And I have seen that in many, in many of the um, ceremonies that I've attended to. One of the ones that was most impressive was an elder um, <clears throat> from out west. <clears throat> when he did uh, ceremonies, he used to stand in the bush somewhere, and he would call out his spirit. And from there, he would dance in, and he would stop at four different places, and then he would call his elder. I didn't understand him because uh, he was uh, way up north of Crete. And so when he would call us, I knew he was calling. Some, somehow, I knew he was calling as a helper. And then he would come. And at that time, we were going into the sweat. It was going to rain. And we could hear the thunder. And when I, uh, <clears throat> when we went into the sweat, and I thought, oh, that was this the first time I'm going to be in the sweat with the thunder. And I wondered how I was going to handle that. But you know what? The thunders were all around us and that. When we came out of the sweat, it, the, the, it didn't rain, but we heard it rain. All around where we were, there was wet spots and everything, all the way around, but not where we were. And I thought, oh, God, he was, he was really, he had a really strong gift for that. The helpers come in many different forms in the traditional healing, healing methods. Sometimes it is an animal, sometimes trees, sacred sticks, special rocks, fire, water plants, or the earth, or a talking stick. Sometimes people, those that have those special gifts, they see their own spirit in, in, um, in the fire. 
or in the water sometimes, or in a stick. And how does one become an elder? Some become born with it, but sometimes they're not aware of it until much later on in life. And I've been attending to many different workshops and many different conferences and many different places. And I, one time there was uh, one here in Peterborough. And, and, and it was a church. I just saw it and uh, written that this man was coming from Manila. And that he had a healing, um, there was a healing service. <clears throat> so I thought, I'm going to go. I know. So when I got to the church, it was done in a church. This priest, he became a priest in Manila. You know. But before he became a priest, he talked about how he uh, acquired his uh, knowledge, his healing methods, or his healing gifts. He says he was only about nine or 10 years old. He said he saw this woman that was blind and, he was sitting, and she was sitting on the, on the street and she had a little cup in front of her where people could drop points or whatever. And all of a sudden he had this empathy, you know, all of a sudden he wanted to help her. He felt he had to do something. So she, he, he knew that she needed help. So he went over to her. And he just uh, felt sorry for her because she couldn't see, she was crippled and all of that. So she um, went over, or he went over, and then he pat her on the back. And I don't know what, he, what, he, what else he did. I can't remember what he did. He actually did something there. But he pat her on the back, and then he went. He just had that moment of uh, wanting to do something. And then he ran, he was, um, when he was running, he looked back, and that lady, he saw that lady get up from her wheelchair. She was no longer crippled, and she was crying, and she could see, and she was yelling, I could see, I can see, and I guess he was watching that little boy where he was running to, and he got scared, so he ran as fast as he could. He ran all the way home, and, uh, he ran to his mother, and then not too long after, there was a knock on the door. And the lady said, it was the same lady, and I guess the lady said, told the story of who she was, of how she was, and that. He says, your son, was that your son? He touched me, yeah. and I am healed. Yeah. And so the mother was really fascinated. <clears throat> and he talked to his little boy, his her son, but she also knew that he had something special. So he grew up, as he was growing up, he knew he never tried again to ever touch anybody because he didn't know whether he did something wrong or whether he did something right or he didn't know how to handle that gift that he had. But as he grew up, he said he, he discovered that. And finally, he came to the decision that uh, he was going to become a priest. And so that's what he did. Was, so uh, he became a priest, and he uh, was doing many healing services. And in that session, the healing ceremony that he, that he did, even though it was a Catholic service, I could see people falling, you know, as he touched them. Well, I was seeing that too, you know, and I, I went. But there are people behind that can catch you in that. So I thought, well, what, what I'm going to say, because he's asking, you know, what they're asking, and see what's going on, and he would touch them. So when he came to me, uh, he just touched me, and I don't remember falling back. You know, you see these on television sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
So sometimes uh, training at an early age begins, or sometimes working at it at an early age as a helper to a healer is like an apprenticeship. Sometimes people experience near-death experience and given those powers. So there are various ways that uh, people receive those kind of uh, powers. Those will go to a vision quest. Some will pass and they experience and want to find out what their calling is. Sometimes you don't believe or are in denial. And so you really have to identify what, uh, what, uh, what you're really called upon. By doing these, they will receive their gifts and their responsibilities are shown to them in their dream or told by people. You know, sometimes they talk to other people, this is the dream that I had, what do you think it means? And oftentimes I've been asked that and sometimes I don't have the answer. Elders don't, sometimes don't have all the answers. Maybe it's somebody else that you know the elder may have that answer. So thus one receives this, it is a big responsibility when you receive those gifts. You don't take it lightly, but it is a big responsibility. And it is here that the direct, that directions are given. They are given special medicine to work it and how to do it. Most healers will have a good life or follow the path according to the teachings. Sometimes people will work with medicine plants or other things that they have been shown to them or been taught by their own teachers. Sometimes they work in counseling and those that are good at coaching, you need to have coaching skills. Uh, sometimes uh, the elders tell you a story uh, and it's up to you to, to, to find what you're being told. <clears throat> because Ojibwe elders will not tell you, well, I think you should do this. You know, they don't have that. Some healing will have the doctoring methods. Some may work with their hands. Um, most will work with ceremonies such as sweats or other kinds of ceremonies, such as shaking tents. Um, in Ojibwe, we don't have shaking tents, but in Cree, they do. Many will have other forms of healing that they get in training. In Medewin, which I'm familiar with, in order to perform a ceremony, one needs a degree in that ceremony. Usually those that perform usually get a second degree, but they don't even tell you that either. I, I'm a second degree in the day, and, you know, they don't say that. It's like a holy order in a religious institution. One that cannot become a priest until one gets schooled after so many years. So it's, it's done in the same way in that culture. What do they use? They use shakers, drumming, singing, or chanting, some uh, stones or eagle whistles or eagle plants. Some will use a little boy drum known as a water drum. In order to know this, this little boy drum, one must know how to tie it, what goes in, and how to do it. Some will only pray. Some will use the sacred pipe. Most will use the four medicines, such as sage, cedar, tobacco, and sweet grass. And what about the medicine people? Some healers are called medicine people. They will work with plant medicines. They are trained to work with medicine properties. These people do not know many procedures in how to the, most people will know many procedures in how to get the medicine, where it's grown, what it is for. They must know how to keep it and how to store it for future use. Because my father, I know that my father used to pick medicines. And we were taught how to prepare it and how to store it, what time to pick it and that. So there's different energies the time that you pick the medicines. They must know what time of the day to pick it at each medicine property has different powerful energy at different times of the day. They have to know how to give it and how many times it must be taken and how much to take it, just like a doctor. They learn these things all year and continue to learn how the plant works in many, many other times. Sometimes you can go as a medicine woman that knows the plant properties is to continue way past them, even though you know the properties of the medicine. 
There are many ways to do doctrine in the Shnabe way. One of the ways is medicine, medicinal plants. They remove, sometimes they remove sickness by withdrawing it from the body. Some healers will have experience of healing diabetes or heart disease or even cancer. The patient must do what the patient must do what the healer or medicine person um, they're asking to do. It is a form of a holistic way. The cause is treated uh, and the condition is talked about. Spiritual healing, another way of healing is spiritual healing. That's how healers look at everything, such as the four parts of the human being. Healers must work with the eagle feather. The energy, it is like a regular. Instead of just hands, they use the energy of the feather to find the root cause. It is one of the most fundamental part of the healing. Some use prayers to heal. Some use powerful methods of discussions, or just talking and listening. Some people are known as seers. These are people, special guests, where they can see beyond sometimes in the future. As you know what the problem is. <clears throat> ceremonies. Many healers do perform ceremonies to help in the healing methods. Some do doctoring in the sweat lodge. Some, some will look after you and then one will sing for a fast towards healing. Kings usually do take a shaking pan to heal, or sometimes other people use the sun dance. The Western players, they use the sun dance, and the sun dance is also, it was not known in my community, but the sun dancers are coming in to teach some of the community members about sun dance. And I have attended some dance, and it's a very powerful place. And there are many protocols that uh, one must go when you do it, when you see the sun dance. Elders are people who follow the traditional teachings. They walk the talk, they do the teachings, they also share what they know. They're wise and share the teachings with you. They have knowledge of the culture and language and history, at least most of them. Sometimes an elder does not have to be a senior. It could be a younger person who has teachings of the language and culture and have been trained in a, at an early age. Some will have earned the respect of the community. They will have developed out that spiritual development in their community and how they do it. And how do I approach them? First is just to be you, to be respectful, have a tobacco offering, usually as an organic tobacco. Not all elders, because of the different religious views, some will not accept tobacco. Some will accept tobacco. It depends on your community. Some will accept a gift, or some will accept a per cloth, because they use these things. But tobacco is known as a communicator between the elder and the spirit. That's why tobacco is given. And there's a long story about how the tobacco could how the tobacco came to Anishinaabek, and I don't have time to talk about it here, but tobacco, sometimes the, the teachings is done at sunrise ceremony, uh, why that is being done. Tobacco is usually uh, wrapped in the cloth, a gift to give to the elder for later to express your gratitude for help, and also to have your answer. They will ask you, what is it that you have, have come for? Or, or what is it that you have asked of me? Or what is it that you want? All those things are uh, done in a way. This is when you begin to speak to him or her what you are asking. One must not be in a state of alcohol or drugs at least for four days. A woman, a woman must be free from her moon time. One must never ask them longer. So what do you do with the tobacco? That's, I've been asked that too. <clears throat> there are certain protocols to an elder, healer, or a medicine person. Many of these people will have helpers who, must, who may give you advice of what to bring. I point out first, one must tell you what you're, what, what you're on, such if you're on a Western medicine, such as drugs or treated by Western medicine. 
Western medicines are now beginning to work with uh, traditional people and also with a medicine person. Um, I work with the physicians of Canada uh, for five years, and they really are improving a lot uh, how to work with the, um, with the traditional people. And they're beginning to have uh, even rooms now in hospitals because one of the most important things is uh, when somebody is dying in the community, that the person is um, <coughs> uh, dying and our Islamic people, it's a cultural thing that they must stay right till the end until that person takes his last breath. And even then, we wait there until the person is gone. And usually, it is the oldest of the family a male person that must escort the body to the morgue and <coughs> come back again. And therefore, when a person comes out of the funeral home, that, el that the eldest must accompany it right to that. Some of these things are dying, um, you know, because we've always kept the, our people. If we don't keep our people in a funeral home, so there's always a person or people, a group of people, to <coughs> Um, <clears throat> to keep on guard is what I understood the person said. To keep on, or to stand on guard uh, until that person is buried. That the person must be guarded 24-7 during that time. In those times, there's people that will tell stories, that will have uh, songs, that will pray, that will talk about the person that's like how he or she has lived their life. Because it's part of history. This is where you'll know the person what he or she has done. As a tradition and culture is more becoming aware in society, there needs to be caution taken. Many will proclaim <coughs> Many will proclaim that they are elders or medicine people <coughs> who have not earned the title or may use the teachings in the wrong way. It is important to be aware of these things, and especially when one who really do not know or are aware of the rule, there's a typo in culture and could be swayed. Especially when one becomes very, very uh, vulnerable when seeking advice or healing or counseling. It is advisable to see people who know, who refer you to the respected people and recognize traditional elders, healers, or medicine people. In conclusion, elders are teachers who teach the vision of life. They explain the Nishnabe philosophies that are handed down in ceremonies and traditional teachings. Traditional philosophy talks about how to live a healthy life. It teaches about strength, in the, na in the native uh, identity. It teaches about how to understand yourself and what new culture means. Approaching elders must be always in be done in a respectful way. <coughs> they are human beings. They treat people the way you want to be treated. But to remember that one must be sober and not have alcohol in the body system for four days. Now sometimes elders will accept somebody who is maybe half, half cut. <laughs> <laughs> In certain circumstances, because maybe the person is suicidal. So the elder usually has, you know, these, these sense of things that the, there's an urgency and will look after that person. In those cases, there are different. And I'll show you some pictures. There's something else I want to talk about at the end. So there are some uh, pictures here. It's an elder. This is an elder who teaches about um, beating. This is uh, another elder um, who just passed away last, last week. Just, um, I came because she's uh, my first, not first, but the second cousin. Um, I was there at the wake. This is another one who's uh, during a ceremony or just beginning. And there are teachings also about the uh, circle of life. Another one, another elder who's 
uh, talking here. This is another one with the hat. Uh, she teaches about uh, basket making. And she's uh, must be about eight, five years old. But I know when I was uh, teaching at Lakehead University during the summer, uh, she must have been about 75 years old. The students decided they were going to have a baseball um, against the uh, faculty members who uh, mixed together. Well, she got on there, and uh, she was good at baseball. <laughs> and she could run, and she had that ball. <laughs> This is another um, traditional person here that's standing and talks about some of the traditions. This is another picture that I found, and an elder smoking a pipe. <laughs> These are elders who are dancers. I'm sure they carry lots of knowledge also with their um, fans and that. Now this is another picture here that I found. It's, in the, it's called on the uh, website Scam mother. It's a native person, a non-native person, who's doing a pipe ceremony. Here's a woman called little grandmother using immense per pipe in Europe passing off herself as a spokesperson for the Lakota people. She's in her buckskin costume, playing wisdom keeper, making big bucks off unsuspected people. And this person says, I have lived in Switzerland, and I have come across white people claiming to be medicine men and women who have gone to the U.S. or Canada and pay up to $5,000 before the euro was installed. For a two-week course at the end of it, you get a certificate saying that you are so much leaders, and I have brought a pair of Spring fertility sweat loss ceremony. Now, this one really got to me. This is an open invitation to our sweat lodge, to being in the spring, in the spring solstice. The sweat lodge is a fraternity of sweat where you can bring your partner or mate or have sex while drinking, while drinking mead, <coughs> honey and wine, or take magic mushrooms to enhance your vision. If you do not have a partner, like the holy orders in Shnabek you know what they're doing. They don't charge. They will accept gifts, maybe tools that they might need. That's okay. But they won't accept money. Some may accept money if you're going to maybe in tenants. They need gas money. So if you're giving Jonia for money, you have to say, this is for your gas. Maybe then they might accept it, and maybe not. That's the only time they will accept it. Or um, <clears throat> if you have some of them, yeah, they might need a shovel, or they might need some other kind of tool. You have to say, say and be specific, and say, this money is for you to buy whatever so and so. That they will accept. That's the only time they will accept money. Travel, if it's called travel on area, right, because the, gas, the car doesn't run on on, uh, on water. <laughs> so, uh, so that way it's acceptable now. 
So that's how you tell the difference between what is set up, what is real, and so. And really, we thank you for listening to me. We got you. I hope you have. Oh, I was going to show you something else about tobacco ties. And this is tobacco, how you can present. You don't need a big bag of tobacco. You don't need one of those. A $16 bag of tobacco to give to an elder. Mm -hmm. You may buy it for yourself so that you can have it. And usually, elders, <clears throat> um, what they need is set up to really uh, um, organic tobacco. You, want some, you don't need to buy those. Uh, it has chemicals in because some of the elders here use pipe tobacco. So, because if you use, uh, if you use the um, tobacco that's being bought, you know, that there's a lot of chemicals in there, and if you get that kind of tobacco to a person, then you're just contributing for him or her to be sick further. So that's why we're cautioning many of the elders, elders that I thought I would begin to tell people that try and get our own tobacco to give to the elders. And most of the time it's um, tobacco, this one here is kind of bad. Kind of small. <laughs> and they don't need big, big bags like that either. They just, you know, use your hand according to your, to your uh, palm of your hand, put it in there with a red cloth. Usually it's red cloth. Because different red, red cloths mean different, different things that you're asking for. The general is the red cloth that you can put in the prayer cloth or in the uh, Talk like this to get to the tobacco. And when you talk to the, uh, the, uh, the elder uh, here, this hand over there, I'll, I'll pretend I'm a student. <laughs> <laughs> so I want something, I want some knowledge. I just don't go. Um, my name is so and so. And I'd like to find out something. <laughs> uh, or sometimes um, they'll just say safety. <laughs> or sometimes they just say <laughs> and they don't even look at you. So when you're giving tobacco to an elder, what you do is you have it on your left hand side because it's closest to your right. And then you on the hand of the individual. And then when I give that tobacco to the individual, I give it. This is what it's supposed to say. What is it that you're asking me to do? And then we're giving that process for you, what, what, what it is that you want. So actually, that was the formal way of doing it. It goes to me. <laughs> and you don't put it in the clinics either. And I know in the past that they asked something, and the person may not, this has happened, and that's happened sometimes. Sometimes, depending on the situation. Well, <clears throat> sometimes something happens, and you don't have the tobacco. So you do all the tobacco. You can ask the question, but you have to tell them. You have to tell that person that I don't have tobacco right now in my hand, but I'll, I'll, as soon as I can, I will give you the, the tobacco. So usually my answer is, okay, I'll put it on the credit card. <laughs> <laughs> and that's just the way of me saying that, you know, that tobacco is coming later on, and that, that she's still old. So, and uh, that's just a fun way of doing it. Not everybody will accept tobacco. Sometimes people will um, accept uh, prayer cards because they use prayer cards for many different purposes. Sometimes uh, for a woman, it's a yellow card that you present because sometimes the women, um, elder women, especially if they have to do moon ceremonies, other people sometimes don't have the cough or they don't come prepared. So you share that. And sometimes when you go into a set, sometimes those prayer cloths are hung there or fast or whenever there's a need, that's when those prayer cloths are, are used. 
So there are many ways that jail can present, and some because uh, because of different religious views for some of the elders. Sometimes they don't still don't use the backboard for a cause, so you give them whatever you have in your hand, a jam or rice or whatever. Things that they might need or use in the future. Not lipstick, <laughs> but something that they can use that is used by them. So, be rich. Be rich.